access to um, Ron Ferguson and also in terms of the last two minutes. Yeah, in terms of my dissertation topic is on low income minority students getting into selective four year colleges. Right. Which is not just the Harvard or the Yales, it's colleges that have less than a 50% selection admission. Right. Have you taken the North Star further out? Because if you look at the statistics, it's 5% of African American and Latinos versus the 15% that are in the selective group. How does your research sort of compare, not just against all normative colleges, but against the four year schools? Because there's research that says you're earning more income. You know, there's a whole status conscious. So I just want to hear a little bit more about that dialogue. Yeah, the, um, what I'm, this North Star notion is for all kinds of kids. The kids for whom they're going to get a doctorate, the kids who are going to drive a truck. Okay, they just have different destinies and they need to search for those. Okay, you do tend to get, earn more money if you go to a more selective school, but the kids who go to more selective schools already were a bit ahead in their skills and might have earned more money even if they hadn't gone to a more selective school. Right, so I don't have anything particularly profound to say in response to your question, except that we just need to help every child find whatever fits best for them and, and pursue it. We, and also, for the kids who want to go to the most elite schools, some of them don't know about financial aid. Okay, we need to let them know that the money is probably going to be there if you just get prepared. Right, and that's part of the mismatch theory, really, right? Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, sir? Oh, yes. My name is Thomas Houston, and my question is actually on Dr. Ferguson's, uh, Ferguson's chart, but anybody can answer it. Uh, we've all seen the videos of the two or four year olds laughing and learning all the words to the songs. And when you look at the chart, you see motor skills by Asians, they learn a lot faster by age of four. But I believe African Americans, in terms of expressive vocabulary, we yes. are leading or number two. Yeah. So that was on the chart teach too. Differently. <laughs> Huh? So that was on the chart, too. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm referring yeah. to. Okay. So not saying that we should teach differently, but should we look at different ways to teach to make sure that we're catching up to how we learn by the age of four? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to just uh, yeah. comment yeah. briefly on, on that because I was fascinated by the chart as well. Um, and it reminded me of a program that uh, I have actually uh, co-developed for um, parents of uh, preschoolers. And um, wh what we discovered is we would take eight hours and teach parents 24 games they could play that would cultivate those kinds of skills that uh, w um, in the child that would enable them to go into kindergarten, able to know their numbers, their colors, and uh, th those conceptual notions that are expected of kindergartners. Yeah. And just one observation on that. First of all, when parents got that knowledge, they pretty quickly got those kids up to the point where they could be prepared for kindergarten. And I've known of uh, at least one other program in Bakersfield, California, where teachers were able to take parents for a week before school start and, and, and uh, work with the parents and the children and get those kids up to speed in a sh relatively short amount of time, it, at least with regard to being prepared for kindergarten. So that's encouraging to me because while the, the charts seem to, to me, could suggest to some people that you got this uh, embedded uh, mm -hmm. deficit mm -hmm. that starts early and, it, and, and now they're never gonna have a chance, what we discovered is they are so pliable at that young age right. till it doesn't really take much of an intervention to get them up to speed at that level anyway. Right, and I put the chart up there because we can do something about it. Right. Okay, if I thought we were stuck in the mud and there's nothing we could do, I wouldn't even have showed it to you. <laughs> okay, now it is tricky. People sometimes get real mad at you for showing this kind of stuff in public. Okay, but we got to talk about it if we can do anything about it. Yeah, and, and right. just a quick word. I, I, I'm encouraged as well. I think it's good for us to have the benchmark. But as Reginald points out, when the schools cooperate with the children in positive ways, you get the positive responses. So the kids operate within a larger environment. And as Bobby's story this morning reminded us, you know, his son didn't have those kinds of deficits when he went to that school, but he, they looked at his face and imprinted yes. those deficits on him and the school system functioned in such a way as to undercut that kid. So I know you're aware of the fact that the, all the connections are there and it's just very good for us to, to be reminded and to have this, this actual concrete example of when you change and vary the interventions, you get immediate positive responses. So if the teachers teach a little differently, if the school looks at those kids differently, you get a more positive response. Thank you.